this morning, we're going to take a one-week detour from Genesis. And in honor of the Reformation, we're going to go to the Gospel of Luke this morning. Luke chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. Uh, The text is printed in your bulletin, but you can follow along in the Bible as well. Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 13. Uh, These are the words of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of Luke. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus said, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And Jesus said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So far, the reading of God's word, I encourage you to keep your Bibles or your bulletins open to Luke 16, because we're going to be referring to it a number of times this morning. Well, Friends, uh, you probably remember a couple of years ago was the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, the beginnings of it, Uh, Luther nailing the 95 Thesis on the Wittenberg door. And at the time, and even today, Uh, there were a lot of people who said, look, given the persecution and the hostility in the world toward Christians and all the challenges that the church is facing, many question whether the Reformation was really a big priority in light of the other challenges that Christians face around the world today. Well, uh, it is true that we live in difficult times. And yet, I think once we read our text... You tell me if the Reformation should be a big deal or not. I think you'll agree it it certainly is. In fact, we need it now today more than ever. And so let's take a look at our text today. At first, Luke 16 looks like Jesus is being a social justice warrior and speaking truth to power. Right? Uh, The biblical principle. If you love money... You can't love God. And he further goes on to say that God demands our love and our loyalty. And this isn't brand new, right? The first of the Ten Commandments, uh, we read there that, uh, we just read it this morning, you shall have no other gods before me. Now that doesn't mean that God is first of all your gods. No, it means that there are no other gods or idols in the presence of God. Before me means in my presence. And it's not just here, over and over throughout the gospel, people would ask Jesus, which is the most important of the commandments? And remember, Jesus said a summary of the Ten Commandments, all the the laws of God, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And so a proper understanding of the first of the Ten Commandments and Jesus' summary of the law means that the absolute love of God must hold sway in everyone's hearts all the time. And it is only, in fact, when we absolutely love God that we can even love others properly. We can love our neighbor as ourselves. But what about money? Can you absolutely love God and also love money? Just like you can absolutely love God and then you love your spouse, you love your children. Is that possible with money? Well, no. Jesus seems to say that there's something about money that competes for our loyalty in a special way. Uh, That's what verse 13 says. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Something about money that competes with our loyalty in a special way. Now, a lot of people today would fully agree with the sentiment of what Jesus is saying. They'd say, look, Jesus is speaking truth to power. He's talking to the one percenters here. Jesus says he's bringing God's wrath and the warning against rich people. But is Jesus really going all social justice warrior here and saying that 
loving money means despising God. Well, Jesus is saying that loving money means that you are at best disloyal to God, and at worst you do despise God. So this is something that we need to hear, especially in a culture of prosperity, although people in poor cultures can have the same problems too. But is that all that Jesus is saying? Is Jesus only warning us about the love of money? Well, let's see. Let's read verse 14 again in our text. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, they heard all these things that Jesus said, and they ridiculed Jesus. They didn't just say, could you maybe be misreading something or tell us more? No, they ridiculed Christ. Now, it's easy for us today to criticize the Pharisees. Because they were lovers of money, we'd say, well, the Pharisees, they must have been like the 1%. They must have been the prosperity preachers like Ken Copeland, who value their private jets. By the way, you know Ken Copeland lives right around in Fort Worth? Eagle Mountain Lake, right around here. How about that? Uh, It's easy to criticize others. But are the Pharisees just a uh, caricature of evil rich people who will do anything to hang on to their money? What basis did they have? Well, if we read the Old Testament, in a theocracy where God and his law governed every part of society, including the government and the king, what does God promise to do for those of his people who are covenantally faithful in a theocracy? What does God promise them? Let's see. Let's go uh, to one of the texts. There are a lot like this, but... In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, this is where Moses is repeating the terms of the covenant with the people of Israel. In Deuteronomy 28, the first six verses, what do we read there? The Lord said, through Moses, And if you people of Israel faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, and if you're careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings that we just read about in chapter 27, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds, and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. And let's jump ahead to verse 11 and 12. And the Lord Yahweh will make you abound in prosperity, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your ground, within the land that the Lord your God swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord Yahweh will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the works of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow, etc. goes on. So in the Bible, in the, in the Pentateuch, over and over and over, God promised that as a reward for biblical living, faithfully keeping covenant, that God would bless his people in many ways, but also including money. He even says, I'll open the treasury and bless you. You'll lend to others. Lend what? You know, you're, you, so God promises to bless his people with money. Money in the Old Testament theocracy is a blessing from God for faithfully following God's commandments. So, when Jesus says here, you can't love God and love money, what did the Pharisees think? Again, this isn't, could you please clarify that? What do you mean? It's, just, it's ridicule. They're probably thinking, well, Jesus, 
What would you say to God when he promised to give money to covenant faithful people? And Jesus doesn't know his Torah. Everyone knows that God rewards his people with money if they're covenantally faithful, right? He says it. And at one level, the Pharisees would have a point. If God blesses covenant faithful people with money, how can Jesus then say that you can't love God and and love money and that money will make you despise God? Well, we get more insight into what Jesus means in the next verse in our text. And I think this will tie it together. So let's look at chapter 16, verse 15. So this is after the Pharisees said they ridiculed him. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, You are those who justify yourselves before men, in the presence of men. But God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. I think the point here, there is a warning, we cannot love money and love God. But Jesus isn't so much talking about money here as he is warning us about what's the big problem. The big problem, according to verse 15, is self-justification. And kids, I just lost all the kids. And they said, what? What self-justification? Well, maybe we could describe it this way. Uh, Since everyone is made in God's image, and everyone has a built-in sense of right and wrong, we are always observing what's happening around us, and we are always making judgments. So people say, don't judge me. It's like everybody's judging everyone all the time. So when we see other people and their actions, we say, that's good or that's bad. That person is really mean. That person is kind. Not only do we judge others primarily, it's because that's what we see, but we also are somewhat always judging ourselves. Now, after man's rebellion against God in the beginning of our history in Genesis, we still have God's image and a conscience, according to Romans 1. But after the fall, our conscience is broken. It's especially broken when it comes to seeing ourselves. We now rarely see ourselves as God sees us in his perfect goodness and holiness. Instead, we have a strange, positive assessment of our own goodness. And we don't really see most of our sins. And and case study, right after the fall, when Adam rebelled against God and committed high treason against God, when God confronted Adam, what was Adam's response? Did he say, I am so sorry, great Lord, that I have offended you. I don't know what I was thinking. I was just mad and I'm a fool and I repent. Is that what he said when God confronted him? No. The the woman, it's the woman's fault. In fact, not just the woman. The woman that you gave me. Adam saw Eve's fault. He also desperately wanted it to be God's fault. But in his eyes, who escaped blame? Adam. I just found myself here. I don't know what else these other people are doing. Adam justified himself by looking at the faults of another. And so it is in our fallen nature to see others' sins pretty clearly, but rarely see our own. In fact, if you had to rank your moral behavior this last week with ten being perfect and one being terrible, what number would you give yourself? I bet very few would say two or one. (laughs) <laughs> say, yeah, you know, I, I remember that sin, and 
that brings it down to maybe a six. And then uh, there were these other, maybe a four. It was a bad week, four. Back to our text. Jesus said, you are those who justify yourselves before men. The Pharisees are often the bad guys. But if, if we understand, they, they're not, well, they revere the living God of the Bible at some level. Now, they, do they truly? No. But at some level, they revered the living God. They honored the scriptures. And at some level, they took very, very seriously the duty to live according to God's commandments. They would say, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day, Psalm 119. They had the truth, and they at one level honored the truth. So what was the problem? The problem is this. They thought that they really were obeying God's truth. Not sure about the other guy, but I know I'm really trying to obey God's truth. Not perfectly. Everyone knows we're not perfect. But they truly tried to be covenantally faithful. They truly tried to pursue justice. And they tried to live as faithful sons of Israel. And because they took keeping God's laws so seriously, they also believed that money and wealth, for the lover of God, that money was a sign of God's favor. He said as much in the Pentateuch. God's blessings for the faithful ones. If you keep my covenant, I will open the treasury of heaven. I'll bless your crops. I'll bless your field. You'll lend money to others. You won't borrow. And so, for the Pharisees then, money was just another metric that they could use to convince themselves that they were faithful followers of God. And that's why Jesus says, you justify yourselves in the sight of man. But is that where that verse ends? But God. But God. You justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. It's got to be five of the most sobering words you can read, but God knows your heart. That's why you think of the psalmist's prayer, search me and know me, know my thoughts. (laughs) No, don't. Uh, That's not, um, but God knows your hearts. God measures our hearts, our motives, according to his perfectly righteous standard. The standard of ultimate, unfailing, constant love for God. And we usually do not judge ourselves according to God's standards. Our tendency is to overlook our failures. To favorably compare ourselves with our neighbors, who it's obvious are messing up. And to justify ourselves. And so now when we fail, uh, you know, it does happen, right? We admit, yeah, I fail. When we fail, it is easier to see our failure. And it is harder to justify ourselves. But what about when we succeed? When we experience the blessings of God? Do we see our failure to love God perfectly and to love our neighbor as ourselves when we are blessed? Friends, I would argue that perhaps the most dangerous times in our lives can be times of blessing when things go well. It's in times of blessing that we are the least introspective and the most self-justifying. We see God's blessings for the Pharisees' money, and we become self-justifiers. We see God's blessing. You know, for me, I'd say, 
30 years of marriage. Julie's a saint. She put up with me for 30 years, but 30 years of marriage. I should write a book, tell others how they can do it. Or six kids, you know, they're all relatively well adjusted and, and in the church and, and everything. And, uh, you know, I should, write a, I should write a book, tell others how. We see God's blessing in our work or on some campaign that we're involved with near and dear to our heart, and we become self-justifiers. Let's look at verse 15. For God knows your hearts, for what is exalted among men is what? Is less than perfect in the sight of God. Is that what it says? What is exalted among men is an abomination. In the sight of God. Whenever we see the use the metrics of success and blessing, and what our group thinks is righteous, we often become self justifiers. But when our thinking well of ourselves, how does God see that? An abomination in the sight of God. Yikes. How many times has Jesus used the word abomination? Not many. This is not just something that is a minor problem that we might want to give a little attention to. According to Jesus, God detests, God hates the self-justifying morality of me and you and your peers. We are not covenantly faithful people. We are not, you know, good people. And anything that encourages us to be self-justifiers in the sight of a holy God is detestable to him. That's why there are probably more Christians in prison than there are outside of prison. Because uh, the people in prison who become believers... There is no, there are very, well, they can too. That self-justifying thing is also there in them too, but it's harder. It's harder to be a self-justifier when you're, you're in prison. You might be thinking, oh, this is OPC. Ouch. You're just bad news, right? Is there any good news? You guys are all law. Is there any good news in us? Well, not in us. And that's why we need the Bible and the Protestant Reformation. We all need to be sons and daughters of Martin Luther, seeing our great sin and that there is no good in us. But realizing then that self-justifying doesn't work, realizing that our self-justifying is actually detestable to God, where do we turn? We turn only where we can in the scripture, and that is to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ loved and served the Father perfectly, Completely. God the Father knew the heart. God knows the heart. God the Father knew the heart of Jesus the Son, the God-man. And the Father pronounced Christ what? Perfect. At the beginning of his ministry, when he was baptized, what did the Father say from heaven? This is my beloved Son. Halfway through his ministry on the Mount of Transfiguration, what did Jesus say? The voice from the the heavens and the glory cloud. This is my beloved son. At the end of his ministry on the earth, what did the father do? The father vindicated the son who took upon himself all of our sin and raised him from the dead. This was righteous. And Jesus said the same. Jesus said in John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but I have come to do the will of him who sent me. 
At the end of his ministry, the high priestly prayer, John 17, what did he say? I have done your will. I have glorified you. I've done what you sent me to do. Friends, Jesus Christ, the God-man, was absolutely, perfectly righteous and was declared righteous by the Father many times. And the good news of the Protestant Reformation is that Christ's perfect righteousness is credited to you by faith alone, by trusting and resting in him, so that when a holy, righteous God looks at you, he doesn't see your wickedness and your lack of love and your despicable self-justifying. No, instead, God sees the perfect obedience and righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Christ's righteousness is then seen as your righteousness. Friend, this is called solus Christus. One of the five solas. That you are justified by holy God only on the basis of Christ's righteousness credited or imputed to you. It is a righteousness that is completely outside of us. It is only in Christ, but he credits it to all those who rest in him. Isn't that beautiful? And so, friends, that's why we need the Protestant Reformation now and the scriptures now more than ever. Because there are people in our circles who are trying to call you to be covenantally faithful Presbyterians, who are trying to call you that you're... Uh, that, Social justice warring and taking the city is. Uh, there are people in our. There's an OPC minister who converted to Rome this last month. I think, what are you thinking? Have you not understood anything? Any so called righteousness that we claim to have is an abomination in the sight of God. not just a little bit of an error. It's an abomination. And God knows our heart. Therefore, the gospel and Jesus calls us to abandon any self-justifying behavior. And he promises to give us rest when we rest only in Jesus' righteousness that he freely gives by his grace alone to all those who trust alone in him. Let's pray.